Who are you and what was your role in the Out at Cambridge study? I'm Sarah Franklin and I um, am the director of the LGBTQ plus program at Cambridge. Um, and when the study was undertaken, I was also the head of department of sociology and I really, really wanted to do something with this program that would make a difference at Cambridge. And so um, I, I wanted the study to engage people. Um, and so my role in the study was basically to um, have the idea of duty and then to get a team together um, who could deliver the study and then make sure we had the funding to deliver the study and then um, put together a research design that would be feasible within a relatively limited amount of time and of course the most important thing of all was to find someone who could conduct the study so we were incredibly fortunate we found you, Elizabeth, to do that. What was the Out at Cambridge study trying to do? Out at Cambridge study was motivated um, initially by an event we did with Stonewall where um, we really looked carefully at the findings from their research on higher education in the UK, which was quite surprising. It was very surprising how high the levels were of non-disclosure of sexual identity. Um, and, and we found that quite worrying. And so it, at one level, we just really wanted to find out, well, what's going on at Cambridge? But the other thing we wanted to do because Q Plus is a research program is that we wanted to show um, how qualitative research can be a very um, effective part of institutional change. How qualitative research can engage people, um, it can move people, um, it can motivate people, um, and it can get people involved. Um, so that's really what we were trying to do with the report. We were trying to find out what was happening, but we were also trying to do so in a way that would show the power of qualitative research to, to change institutional culture. Did the study succeed in its objectives? I have to say I was really surprised how successful it was. Um, I did really have high hopes for the study. I'm a big believer as an educator in what research can do and how research can involve people um, and the value of research in telling people things they didn't know. Um, and you know, it can often be surprising and some of the findings were quite surprising. Um, but I, I think I had no idea how wide the take up would be of the study, how many people would read the study and, and respond to the study. That motivated us to workshop the study with a range of different groups. And that process is ongoing. And actually, you know, I think that that study has really been transformative at Cambridge far beyond what I had expected. And I'm really, really pleased about that. I think we were lucky that the study coincided with a period of increasing interest in this area and you know what we might call culture change more broadly. So I don't think we can take complete credit for what happened to Cambridge, but we were definitely doing the right study at the right time. Has it made a difference at Cambridge? The study has definitely made a difference at Cambridge. There's no doubt about that. Um, we've had an absolutely massive response and what we've been able to do is to extract from the study some very practical things that we can do at Cambridge and we've already started doing them. So we've, what we've done is we've, through the study, but also through other activities, we've linked up with the new alumni group, the new LGBTQ alumni group at Cambridge, the staff group at Cambridge and also the student group within um, the student union and therefore all the student reps at all the colleges. And what they've asked us to do is to try and implement some of the findings of the report about visibility. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get every college to put a bit of information on their website about LGBTQ activities at, at Cambridge. And we're trying to see if we could get an LGBTQ in every college and potentially also um, academic staff member in every department. 
And I think this, this is a really important example of how research on your own university can help you change your university to make it a more open, accessible, and, and, um, and, and, and successful place. Why is the Outer Cambridge study important? Well, I mean, I think there's three main reasons the, the study is really important. Again, it's an example of why doing research on your own institution can really make a difference. Um, and why it's important to take that seriously as part of the work we do. I mean, if we're committed to the idea that universities should widen participation, you know, if we take seriously the fact that research cultures need to be more accessible and open and accountable, if we take seriously the fact that, you know, some people obviously feel much more comfortable to be able to be who they are at work than others, if we take those issues seriously, then we need to do the homework, you know, the, the homework about what needs to change. And, and, and the second reason is that we need to get people to come along with that change. It's one thing to have a bunch of experts come in and tell you what you need to do in your institution. If people don't understand that, if they can't see that, if they can't have examples of that, that they can relate to, they're not gonna be motivated to change and they're not gonna feel like it's important. Um, so the third reason is that this isn't the only area where widening participation and greater inclusivity is absolutely critical. I think everybody's very aware um, that Cambridge, like you know, many universities and like many UK universities, faces some very serious changes, not just around LGBTQ, but around race, around gender, around class. Um, around underprivileged students coming to Cambridge, all of these areas are not going to change by themselves and they're not going to just change by people having aspirational statements and diversity quotas. They're going to change by people figuring out what exactly are the obstacles, figuring out exactly how they can be overcome and figuring out how to get people to believe in that and to see that and to want to do that. What were some of the findings you found most important or interesting? Well, I mean, we found, we, there were so many things we found study that were really important and interesting. And that is very much credit to you, Elizabeth, having done such a fantastic job of interviewing people and really finding out um, what they thought and what they felt and um, being able to find out in more detail why, you know, they feel the way they do. That was, that was a very, very powerful part of this report. Um, and, you know, I think what we found was that one of the things that's most important to people is just to feel that they're an ordinary part of the community and that the community's ordinary life is something they feel part of. And I think it's very difficult to, to overestimate, it's impossible to overestimate really how uncomfortable it is when somebody feels that, that their ordinary doesn't really fit with the institutional culture or, or the other way around, that the ordinary of the institutional culture isn't something that they can be part of. I think that's one of the things the study really showed that <clears throat> for the people who really don't feel that they can participate in things. It's a very, very seriously disabling um, feeling of, of alienation such that they, you know, might even consider leaving. Um, and um, so I think one of the findings I actually liked most um, was the um, finding about the lanyard. Um, I particularly like the lanyard finding. Um, and I, I actually didn't really understand the lanyard finding when we first had people say, you know, how much they appreciated seeing the, the rainbow lanyard. Because, I mean, obviously people are going to appreciate seeing the rainbow flag and the rainbow lanyard and all of that. But um, I think our study helped me understand why the lanyard was so important to people, which is that it's, it's just such an ordinary thing. You know, it's just something people wear around their neck. It's not a big statement. It doesn't even say if, you know, that person is LGBTQ. It just says that our ordinary here 
or image is one that is including LGBTQ, and that's something that we like about our community. It's a very simple kind of outstretched hand to people um, um, that, 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 that makes them feel safer. And I think an interesting thing about the rainbow lanyard is that it's not just LGBTQ people who feel safer when they see the, uh, the, the rainbow lanyard. And it's very interesting the rainbow idiom has been taken up by the NHS in the context of COVID um, because there's a kind of transfer from the way the rainbow has been used as a sign of welcome um, to a way it's been um, used as a sign of solidarity. And that's really what the rainbow lanyard has become. It's become a sign of solidarity. Um, and that's why it's important to see the LGBTQ um, change is a model for how change can happen in general. Um, I think it's one of the other things our program has done. It's given a model um, that can be replicated of how to make change happen, um, how to make culture change within the institution happen, how to make it real, um, how to make it palpable, um, and how to make it effective. What are things you think have been left out or underemphasized? Yeah, well, that's a really important question. What did the report leave out? Um, obviously, um, it's impossible to be comprehensive. And one of the things that was most obviously left out is that not all um, LGBTQ identities are um, involving, as it were, disclosure. Um, you know, some trans identities are not about disclosure. Some non-binary identities are not about disclosure. The whole question of when is disclosure a choice and for whom is it a choice is one of the things that we really need to do some more work on and we will. Um, I think the other thing for our program generally that's really critical is the way LGBTQ identities intersect with other identities. Um, obviously the experience of a black trans person is going to be very different from you know a white gay person. Um, I mean not necessarily different in all ways but but in the aggregate, there are going to be some very important differences. And the differences were hard, I think, to pull out in part because Cambridge is still, in many ways, a very homogenous community, certainly racially. It's very white. Um, but also because, you know, it was a short study, we weren't able to go into depth in those things. But going forward, in terms of both research and institutional culture, those will be areas where we need to think a lot more about what is the trans experience at Cambridge and in general, and, um, and, and in what ways are the whole um, intersectional aspects of identity important to take account of. Do you think the study will have a lasting impact? Well, I certainly like to think the study will have a lasting impact. It's lasted a lot longer than I thought already. Um, I do, I really hope the study will continue to be a talking point. I hope the study will continue to stimulate conversation. And of course, one of the reasons we're doing these videos is to, to encourage those conversations to take place. If the study leads to all 31 colleges at Cambridge adopting some changes. I think that will be a very significant and very lasting um, impact. And, and I think the program in general has had a significant transformational effect at Cambridge. Um, and, you know, it's, it's in some ways, I suppose, not for me to say um, as a person who's so centrally involved in leading it, but I do think that it will continue to um, coincide with some very major changes in how research is done, as well as how teaching is done and how workplace culture is organized. And those are the three areas, I think, where we're gonna see a lot of change in, in part because of COVID. We're gonna see a lot of changes in how research is done, who it's done with, how its impacts and audiences are defined. We're gonna see a lot of changes in teaching we're going to have a more opportunity to be a lot more inclusive in our teaching. Um, the expectations that we do that will be increasing as well. And that will correspond to changes in research culture and how we organize ourselves as departments, as disciplines, as teaching teams, 
as research teams, um, those are all changing right now. And I hope very, very much that this report and this program will be at the center of that change for, for a long time to come. Thank you.